Good afternoon, I'm Serena Collado, Director of Community Health at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, Summerside. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, A Healthy Uterus, held in collaboration with Friends Health Connection. During today's webinar, we will discuss conditions of the uterus, including cervical cancer, the importance of an annual pap smear, the role of folic acid, and strategies to promote fertility, as well as a healthy pregnancy. Our guest today is Dr. Amanda Francis, a board-certified obstetrician gynecologist with Robert Wood Johnson's Physician Enterprises, Rosland OBG. Um, uh, we will begin with a moderated um, 20 minutes discussion, and then we will open it up for questions and answers from our audience. Um, Dr. Francis, thank you so much for joining thank us for today. I know how busy you are. Um, let us start um, by maybe you telling our audience a little bit about yourself. Uh, as you said, I'm a board certified OBGYN. I've been in practice since 2016 when I graduated from uh, residency at Morristown um, uh, Atlantic Health University or <laughs> Atlantic Health um, Organization, I don't know. Atlantic Healthcare. Atlantic Healthcare, yeah. I don't know why I can't think of the name right now. It's affiliated with Thomas Jefferson University. Um, I am. Uh, I specialize in general OBGYN, so I do OB gynecology. I do family planning a little bit. Um, I do pretty much everything that a general OBGYN can do, um, sort of including gynecologic surgery. Um, um, I do deliveries, I do C-sections, I take care of pregnant women, um, I take care of all women basically through all stages of life in terms of their gynecologic needs. Wonderful. Thank you for that with us. Maybe we can also start by giving the audience an overview of um, the uterus and what its function is. Right. So the uterus is primarily for the purposes of carrying pregnancy. We have an organ in our body that's just for that. Um, outside of that time when it's just, it's housing and pregnancy, it reaches this, a homeostasis within the rest of our body. So we have our cycle that again, lets us know that we're fertile or able to carry um, children still or to become pregnant. And you know, that time is marked, the beginning of that time is marked with the start of menses or menarche, and the end of that time is marked with the end of menses or menopause. So that's really what the purpose of the uterus is, is just, you know, to assist us in that time period of fertility. Wonderful. Thank you. So what are some of the common health uh, issues related to the uterus? So we know like some common ones are endometriosis and fibroid cysts, things like that. Right. So fibroids are very common in women. They are benign or not cancerous smooth muscle tumors of the uterus. They can be located uh, throughout the uterus. Unfortunately, they can actually be located um, in the pelvis as well, um, attached to other, um, to the ovaries. Uh, they're a little bit different in that point and they can have a little bit different components. But like I said, um, Fibroids are very common uh, growths on the uterus. Endometriosis, thankfully, not nearly as common as fibroids, but a very common diagnosis. Um, basically, when the cells that line the uterus are found in other places outside the endometrial cavity, most commonly on the ovaries. Um, again, called the condition is called endometriosis. It's, um, it's characterized by pelvic pain, um, typically with menses, but can also be, unfortunately, throughout the cycle. Um, other common things, um, the most common gynecologic cancer in the United States is endometrial cancer or cancer of the lining of the uterus. So abnormal cells growing in the lining of the uterus. Um, I think some other common things, benign things that happen with the uterus are um, heavy periods. Um, something called a Nebothian cyst is a common cyst on the cervix, which can be noticed on a pap smear. Um, some other common things with the uterus. Um, something else that's, that's very common that can cause pelvic pain is something called adenomyosis or um, kind of an endometriosis, but it's specifically when those cells that are supposed to be the lining of the uterus are outside of the cavity, they're actually in the muscle layers of the uterus. So they're not where they're supposed to be, but they're not outside the uterus. They're still in a place that causes problems. Again, pelvic pain typically with the cycle, but can be outside of that um, time. Wow, thank you. That was a great overview. Yeah, I appreciate that. 
So what are some things women can do then to keep their uterus healthy? So first, of course, I want to recommend everyone get an annual pap smear, I'm sorry, an annual exam that can include a pap smear. So if you've never had a pap smear, then the first time we want you to start getting one is going to be starting at 21 years old. Back in the day, we used to say when you start when you get your period or you start when you begin having sexual intercourse. Now all of that's gone. We only want you to start getting pap smears at 21. However, your first gynecologic or annual exam can start when you start having your period. So that's the time to go in and see a gynecologist, start you know, a relationship and say, is this normal? Is everything fine? And then you can address any other issues or questions or concerns that you have. And that's typically when you want to just start doing annual exams. So a way to keep healthy is start with regular care, specialized care of your reproductive system. So with annual exams, we're gonna talk about what's normal for your periods. We're gonna talk about any issues you're having with urination. Are you having any vaginal discharge or pain? Are you sexually active? Are you interested in testing for sexually transmitted infections or do you need contraception? We're looking to see if you are having any other issues that are like maybe constipation or pelvic pain, things like that. So again, once you start at 21 is when you start the pap smear. The pap smear is a screening test for cervical cancer. Cervical cancer is abnormal cells, um, cancerous cells on the cervix. The only way to uh, screen for it, there's not a lot of screening tests out there, unfortunately. Um, there's only a few screening tests, um, which are tests that we can do on everyone, regardless of whether or not they have symptoms. So a pap smear is done on anyone who has a cervix starting at 21 years old. So it's a very specific test. A lot of times people think once they get a speculum put in, that's a, that's a pap smear. Not true. All that duck bill is, is just to open up the vagina so we can see right into the back at the cervix. So you may have a speculum exam done in a doctor's office if you have complaints of a discharge or pain, or maybe if you're having bleeding that's a little bit more than your usual, then they'll look to see how much is happening. That doesn't mean they're doing a pap smear. So Best ways to keep your uterus healthy, your reproductive system healthy, is for yearly pelvic exams, starting around the time when you get your period to make sure everything's going okay. And then pap smear starting at 21 years old. And then after that, if it's negative or normal and you don't have any abnormal cells on your cervix, you don't have to get yearly pap smears anymore. We just changed the recommendations about eight years ago. So you only have to get a pap smear every three to five years, depending on your habits, your um, sexual habits. Um, if you had an abnormal pap smear in your past, that's something that needs to be followed more frequently, typically every year. And that's going to require follow-up with a gynecologist. So I was going to say, you mentioned the cervix and we mm -hmm. know that that's the lower part of the, the uterus. Of the uterus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So tell us, uh, and you also mentioned cervical cancer, but I want to come back to cervical yeah. cancer. So are there any other conditions, um, of the cervix? Um, that, you know, um, that are common in individuals um, or concerns, conditions or concerns of the cervix? Common things, some things like a cervical polyp or growth, you know, you, uh, I think a lot of people associate polyps with colon polyps that you notice when you get a colonoscopy. Um, you can have polyps anywhere. They're really just small growths of tissue, typically mucosa or a specific lining of your organs. So um, you can get polyps anywhere and you can certainly get them on your cervix. You can get them in your endometrial cavity and cervical polyps can, are common and they can cause things like bleeding with intercourse. And sometimes if you're a very avid um, exerciser, like biker, runner, they can cause bleeding typically going to be outside your cycle. So um, cervical polyps or endometrial polyps are also very common um, conditions of the cervix besides um, cervical cancer. We also mentioned before I was talking about things that happen in your uterus. Nobothian cysts are just cysts that can happen on your cervix. Um, we like to name things in medicine after people. I guess the person who discovered these cysts was Nabothi something, but um, that's the name of a cyst on your cervix. Again, not a problem. It can become issue, an issue if it's very large and symptomatic, but just benign growth on your cervix. Okay, so how common is cervical cancer? Cervical cancer is very is not a very common cause of death in the United States, thankfully. It only causes about 1% to 2% of death in the United States, and that's because we have such a robust screening program. It's actually um, one of the most, it's the most common cause, gynecologic cause of cancer worldwide because of the lack of screening, really infrastructure, money, things like that, that fortunately the United States has a lot of. So we have a, an infrastructure around screening, which is a pap smear. 
So basically, like I said, testing everyone, regardless of whether or not they have any symptoms to see if they have any abnormal cells and then being able to act early because luckily cervical cancer grows very slowly for most people. Um, it gives us time to intervene and make sure that we get precancerous cells and even like um, stage one cervical cancer a lot of times. So you may have mentioned this a little bit, but could you um, just to be clear, what are the signs and symptoms of cervical cancer? Um, things to be worried about would be um, bleeding after sex or bleeding in between your periods. Um, I think when you talk about cancer symptoms, we're thinking about things that happen, you, you, you see in a movie that character that you know is not gonna do well, they're very tired, they're not, they're not gaining weight or they're losing weight, they're not hungry, they're, they don't have an appetite, they're very, like I said, they have lots of fatigue. So that would be unfortunately advanced stage cancer. Um, early stages of cervical cancer, again, they're really not gonna see any symptoms. Maybe you would see, and we say early stages, we're talking like stage one which is not able to be seen by the eye. So you really wouldn't have any symptoms. If you did, possibly some bleeding, um, but again, very rare. So that's another reason why, you know, again, we're so lucky in the United States because we have a screening program. We catch cancer, not only in the precancerous stage, but typically in stage one. Well, that's a good thing that we have these yeah, programs in the United States. Exactly. So, <clears throat> so you have mentioned, I think cervical cancer was a leading cause death among women, but um, pap smears have helped with early detection mm -hmm. and have helped with more, more mortality rates exactly. drop significantly. Yeah. So uh, again, I think you went into a little bit, but maybe a little bit more if you could. Mm -hmm. What is involved with the pap smear? Um, and again, you mentioned who should get it and when, which was 21. Correct. But can you maybe go into a little bit more detail on, you know, what's involved? You should have brought a speculum with me. Um, the, the thing that we all think of, I think when we go to the gynecologist, that's you know, metal, which um, there's different types of speculum now. They're typically tapes shaped like a duck bill. It opens up so that we can remove the vaginal walls to the point so we can see the cervix, which sits at the back of the vagina. It's, again, the opening of the uterus. Um, we put the speculum in just to gain access to the cervix. And then we're taking a very small tool that's just going to take a scraping of cells from the specific place, which is the um, in not just the cervix, but in the endocervical canal or the outside of the cervix that goes, that says, okay, here's the outside and then it goes to the inside. So we want to just very lightly go in there. It's uh, analogous to doing like a cheek scraping. You know, when people, a lot of people I think are familiar with having DNA tests, they just ask you to swipe the inside of your mouth with a Q-tip. That's basically what we're doing. We don't use a Q-tip, but we do just take a slight um, scraping of cells from that specific place not as easy to access as your mouth, which is why it's so uncomfortable, but it is a very non-invasive test. Um, we just remove those cells and then this, the results take about seven to 10 business days to come back. Um, and then it tells us, the pap smear tells us, do you have any abnormal cells on your cervix? Do you have the presence of the HPV virus? And if you have any abnormal cells, are they very abnormal? Are they slightly abnormal? And the purpose of this test isn't to say, yes, you have cancer or no, don't you have cancer? It's to answer those three questions specifically so we can do further testing. So if you get a call from your gynecologist, a lot of gynecologists do what I do and they don't call patients or they'll send them a letter saying that it's normal or they won't call them if it's normal. So if you get a call about a pap smear, it's most likely just to say, we need to do this again in a year or we need you to come in and do another test. It doesn't mean that you have cancer. No. Most so, often times. <laughs> so can cervical cancer be prevented? Well, I know the pap smear yeah. is just a diagnostic tool to right. see if you have it, but Definitely. ultimately can one prevent cervical cancer? I think, you and know, how? yes, the HPV vaccine, uh, it's also called the Gardasil vaccine, mm -hmm. is protects against nine of the most commonly found types of cervical cancer, of um, HPV in cervical cancer. So over 95% of cervical cancer is caused by the HPV virus or the human papilloma virus. And like I said, this Gardasil vaccine or the HPV vaccine protects against nine of those high risk types. Um, this vaccine we recommend prior to the initiation of sexual intercourse. So kids are getting a ton of vaccines when they're in school and this should just be lumped right into those. Um, the FDA actually approved it for as young as nine. A lot of parents, I think in the beginning when it first came out around, wow, like almost 20 years ago, um, were concerned about how do I talk to my kid about, how do I talk to my nine-year-old about sex? But nowadays, because again, it's become so common. And I think that because children are, have 
to get so many vaccines through school, it's just lumped right in there. And a lot of children nowadays, a lot of patients that I'm seeing in their early 20s, mid 20s, they've had it and they didn't even think anything of it because it was just another vaccine. And I mean, if, if we could do vaccines to prevent other types of cancer, I don't think anyone else would, I don't think anyone be, would be upset. So there's certainly a way to prevent cervical cancer. Like I said, most of cervical cancer is caused by HPV and we are, and I think they're actually in the progress of working on a new uh, vaccine, but I don't, I don't know any specifics about when it would be released, but the Gardasil vaccine is available and it's covered by insurance. So the rate age recommended to start is not as young as nine, um, but you can actually get insurance coverage up to, I believe, I know 26, the FDA recently approved the Gardasil vaccine up to age 45. Insurance companies, that was, I think, two years ago, maybe three years ago now. So sometimes insurance companies are a little slow to reimburse or cover over 26, but it's certainly worth asking about because FDA has approved it. So who, you gave us an age range, but who's a candidate? Is it strictly for females? No, or? men, boys and girls. So HPV is, um, can cause not only cervical cancer, can cause anal cancer, throat cancer. Uh, so these are, can all be prevented, like I said, with the HPV vaccine. There's a lot of other causes of throat cancer, but this specific type of throat cancer um, and, you know, virally mediated would be through um, preventing um, through with the vaccine. Okay. So we know that um, a healthy uterus is the key to a healthy preg pregnancy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So what should a woman do before she gets pregnant to ensure a healthy pregnancy? Definitely keep up to date with your screening. So make sure you have your annual exam with your gynecologist. Make sure you're up to date with your pap smears. Um, just making sure that you are, you know, checking in and really doing not just your gynecologic health, but overall health. So checking in with your primary care doctor, getting those dentist appointments out of the way. Overall health is going to be paramount to having a healthy pregnancy. Wonderful. Thank you. So how does a woman's age um, affect the chances of a healthy pregnancy and a healthy baby. Um, like maybe you can share, also share, what are the challenges of having a baby after age 35? Right. So after 35 um, is when we start to notice and see a noticeable decline in fertility, specifically for the purposes or as a result of declining egg quality. So starting at um, when your period starts, your fertility is peaking. It peaks to about your mid-20s. And then it starts to go down very, very um, not noticeably, negligibly. And then between 25 and 35, it's pretty much the same. And then at 35, like I so said, you, you start to see a decline in the quality of in the egg quality and marked decline between 35 and 40. Um, and over 40, I'm sorry, over 40 is what I was talking about before. But um, so that's one of, the one of the challenges of having a healthy pregnancy after 35 is declining egg quality. So you're gonna see more the increased chance of miscarriages, an increased chance of um, not only inherited birth defects, but other chromosome, things that can result from chromosomal abnormalities. So pregnancy issues, you're gonna be more likely to see hypertensive disorders as well as uh, gestational diabetes as you get older, um, as you begin to have pregnancies over the age of 35. Um, but that doesn't mean that women over the age of 35 can't have a healthy pregnancy. It's important to address any health issues that anyone has in the beginning and be able to mitigate them as by, you know, being aware of them with your doctor. And like I said, starting from a healthy place, you know, if you're someone who has high blood pressure, then we want to make sure that's under control. Whether or not you need medications is going to be something that you are able to establish hopefully prior to pregnancy. And if you haven't, this is a great opportunity to get it under control. Okay. Um, so why then is prenatal care so important? Prenatal care is so important because your body is going through so many changes throughout pregnancy. You, the OBGYN is really a touchstone to see, is this normal? Because there's a lot of things, a lot of changes that are unexpected and can be very disconcerting, but are part of the normal parts of pregnancy. A doctor, seeing a doctor in pregnancy on a regular basis is going to be there to see these, okay, this is not normal. This is something that needs to be followed up. This is something that's going to need additional care. And the only way to know that really is to see someone on a regular basis. Like I said, I think the main importance of prenatal care is that your body is going through so many changes in such a short period of time. I know it doesn't seem like it's a short period of time when you're pregnant, but you know, a year is a lot, is a lot to go through in, in like 10 months basically. So the importance of prenatal care is to make sure that everything that's happening to you is normal and that there's nothing that's not normal happening for the baby. 
So do you have any recommend, recommendations for mom's diet while during pregnancy? Oh, like what foods course. do you, can you eat? What foods should you avoid? Things like that. Yeah, I have a very, I think, I think because, you know, being young, like I have a different take on diet, you know, I'm looking to help women to not go through pregnancy with fear. We you are going through so much change. We want to keep as much control as possible in places that will help have a healthy pregnancy and healthy mom. So if you are having a healthy diet, then great. Keep up with a healthy diet. If that includes fish, if that includes, um, oh, lunch meats, that's okay. It's not, that's not the issue. Dietary recommendations, again, this is something you're going to want to talk in detail with about your, with your OBGYN, not just from a webinar, but the purpose of dietary restrictions is to limit the instances of potential infection. We don't know what causes preterm labor. We only have significant risk factors, the most important of which being prior preterm labor and the second of which being infection. So we're looking at places where we can minimize infection by limiting the kinds of things that you're eating. So this is why we recommend not to eat any soft cheeses that aren't pasteurized. First of all, in the United States, it's very hard to find an unpasteurized cheese unless you're going to your friend's house who may, has a goat and they make their own cheese. That's probably not pasteurized. But I don't know if you want to eat that if you know you don't trust that friend very much. But there's also, again, um, fish. Fish is a great source of omega-3 fatty acids. It's a lean source of meat. Some people only eat fish. We don't want you to stop eating fish. We do want you to be mindful of the mercury content, depending on what type of fish you're eating and how much. Um, raw foods, again, there's cultures that raw foods are a staple of their diet. And those cultures, those countries, we have data, they don't have increased risks of preterm labor as a result of those diets. So we don't want to have you change something that's intrinsic to who you are and helps has helped keep you the healthy person that you are. We want you to keep those healthy habits. We want you to just make slight adjustments to um, have a healthy pregnancy. And again, eating raw foods, specifically raw fish, we're talking about sushi grade fish that you had in a restaurant, it's a reliable restaurant, has a good grade from the health department. That's not as much of an issue as eating some sketchy potato salad that's that, that Memorial Day picnic. You don't know what, how long it's been sitting out there. You don't know when it was made, if it was refrigerated at any time. That's a lot more sketchy than going to your local sushi restaurant that has an A from the health department that you've been eating at for the past year, never had any issues. They've never had any citations. I would re much more recommend you having your normal sushi that you have there on Wednesdays versus that sketch potato salad. So diet takeaways would be stay healthy, make sure you're eating seasonal vegetables. If you're eating fish, make sure you're not getting a high mercury content. The CDC website is a great place for that and make sure that you're getting those prenatal vitamins. The folic acid, you can get nutritional sources from those leafy green vegetables, but folic acid is one of the few recommendations that we can make that definitely say that's gonna prevent neural tube defects or how the baby's spine grows, making sure that there's no issues with that. So um, healthy diet, um, lots of water, minimize those sugary drinks. Caffeine is okay as long as it's less than eight, eight ounces or less per day. Um, and like I said, just keeping up with all those nutritional sources of vitamins in addition to those prenatal vitamins. Very good. So to find out about tuna or CDC. Yeah, CD typically, often. yeah. I mean, most people get the fillets, like it's, I think it's six, less than six ounces, um, less, less than six ounces of, I think it's the albacore a week, but check with the CDC website. They have a very easy to access way of finding it. Not just for tuna, that's just a common fish that you see at the grocery store. You're, out on vacation or you catch something yourself if you're open water fishing because typically mercury content fishes are going to be very large fish so you're not going to really encounter those besides tuna in your regular uh, shopping uh, habits hmm. well thank you i didn't know that about the cdc yeah um so what types of exercise do you recommend during pregnancy Exercise and pregnancy want to continue good exercise habits that you've already established. If you're someone who's naive to exercise and you've never been, um, you've never been to the gym, you don't really have a regular exercise routine, then it's not a bad idea to start, but you want to start it like you would even if you weren't in pregnancy. Start off slow. Start with just taking a walk. We don't want you to exert, overexert yourself. We don't want you to just start going to cross <laughs> by any means. Just start taking a walk 20 to 30 minutes a day, three times a week the best way to start an exercise routine. If you have an exercise routine, if you're someone who's very familiar with exercise, you have a routine that's been helping you maintain your weight for your entire life, we don't want you to change that. We want you to just modify it for what is comfortable for you. So the, the adage is typically, if you're someone who is a runner, 
if you're able to have a conversation with a partner, like with a running buddy while you're running during pregnancy, then that's okay. If you can't catch your breath after a couple minutes of stopping, then you should not be doing that. So if you're typically someone who runs six miles a day and you run it at like a maybe a four or five minute mile pace, you may need to scale that back. But if that's something that you've been doing for 10 or 15 years, then we certainly don't want you to stop. We want, again, we don't want you to go through pregnancy with fear. We want you to keep your life, your healthy habits that have kept you the healthy person that you are your entire life. We just want you to modify so that you can have a healthy pregnancy. Great. Well, thank you for that explanation. Yeah. So I want to give our members of our audience some time to ask some questions. So um, let's open it up. For those members of the audience, you can go onto the chat feature and then type in a question. We do have one already. So how can people make an appointment um, with you <laughs> and get more information about your service? Um, you can make an appointment with me. Um, um, I'm, you can find me on um, RWJ uh, Barnabas, the website, Find a Doctor. Um, my office, my private office is in Warren. I work with um, Dr. Twinell and Dr. DeAngelis, and we also have a midwife that works with us, Ann uh, Rizcala. Um, I, like I said, we do deliveries. We see comprehensive, we provide comprehensive obstetric and gynecologic care for women. Um, yeah. That's great. And I'll give everybody the hospital um, uh, physician referral service later, awesome, and awesome. as well as the website. Um, another question, can you talk about vaginal drop during menopause? Um, <laughs> I'm not really sure what vaginal drop refers to. I can talk about some of the vaginal changes that happen during menopause. So basically, um, menopause is when you go from your um, baseline level of estrogen, progesterone, the hormones that are released from your ovaries that allow us to be reproductively um, fertile so that you have a cycle, you're releasing eggs of like a good, a good quality and you know you have uh, all of the systems that will allow like said, not just a uterus but you have your ovaries releasing hormones that allow your vaginal mucus and your cervical mucus to be um, uh, pro fertility. So after those hormones decline, we're talking about a significant decrease um, during menopause, you'll start to notice some physiological effects like vaginal dryness, itching. Sometimes it, that can show up as painful intercourse. Sometimes that can show up as feeling like you have a urinary tract infection very frequently. So these are things that, changes that happen in the vagina that aren't necessarily um, pathology or problems. There are natural changes that occur. And it's important to, again, have a, someone that you can talk to about them to find out, okay, what's normal for me, what's not normal, uh, so that things that can be treated and we can also, again, help you. It's, and again, it's a lot of change. Pregnancy is a huge time of change, but also menopause is a huge time of change where patients a lot of times need support and just someone to talk to about all the things that are happening. And, you know, just some of those changes with the vagina is just some of the changes that can happen during menopause. So our next question, a um, little broad, um, what can we do um, when we're young to stay healthy as we age? So I'm not sure if that's related to the uterus or, right. if that in, or in general. Um, I would say diet is important. Again, checking in with the primary care. When you're young, like under 35, you probably only go to the doctor when you're sick. But as we get, I, mean, I think you're still young, under, I think under 80. Well, I don't know, that might, that might be extra, but under 75, I would still you consider you not old. I think the technical medical de designation for elderly is 85. But so between 35 and 75, you're going to start going to the doctor on a yearly basis, dentist appointments on a yearly basis. So you're your primary care doctor is going to have a whole host of screening tests that they're going to recommend to you based on your age. Keeping up with those screening tests in addition to regular dental cleanings is a good way to stay healthy as you age. Okay. Well, can somebody get pregnant with only one ovary? Certainly. Certainly. Um, actually, when we have our cycles, we don't ovulate from both ovaries at one time. We only ovulate from one ovary per cycle. So for patients who've had an ovary removed, their ovary that remains will actually compensate by ovulating six every month. So people, if you have two ovaries, right one month, left one month, typically sometimes there'll be two, sometimes two the other, you know, your body is not exact like that. But if you only have one ovary, then you're going to ovulate from that same ovary every month. So your fertility would not be changed. So it's the same likelihood of getting pregnant as anybody else? According or? to age. So we're talking okay. about someone who's 25, who had an ovary removed for, um, a, there's a couple reasons why that could happen. Then she would have the same potential of getting pregnant that she would 
after having that ovary removed. Very good. So um, another question from the audience is what causes chronic urinary tract infections? And what would you recommend to somebody who has those? Chronic urinary tract infections, I think the most important thing with that is um, diagnosis, making sure that that's actually what's going on. Like we were talking about, um, if you're going, if you're starting to get on that point in your life where you're missing periods or you're having hot flashes, you're feeling like you have chronic urinary tract infections, it's very possible that it could be as a result of those hormonal changes in the vagina. So even if it's not, that's not your situation, making sure that it's in fact a, a, a urinary tract infection, not maybe a vaginal infection, or maybe something like urinary incontinence or urinary urgency, which is feels like it could be urinary tract infection, but there's not actually any bacteria associated with it. Okay. More questions are coming in. Another one is, um, how does dental cleaning affect your overall health? So dental health is a part of your health. And that has, there's a lot of studies that show that dental, um, dental caries and bacteria that is found in dental abscesses and you know the overall tooth decay that can happen in result of people who don't care for their teeth on a regular basis can see um, cardiac infections, so pericarditis or infections in the, out, the outer covering of your heart. And we were talking about specifically with pregnancy, um, if you don't have a healthy heart, if, you, if you're at risk for any type of infection, whether it's an abscess in your tooth, or a pericarditis, then that's not going to be the best situation to have for a pregnancy. Okay. Are there any tests that can be done to determine that? Um, urinary tract infections? I don't know. This, one, uh, this question from a member of our audience is what tests can be done to determine this, and obviously after the overall dental cleaning. So I'm not um, sure maybe the urinary tract. Maybe it was just kind of the way the audience members tests for. Well, I think I think it may be related to the chronic urinary tract infection. So okay. chronic urinary tract infections, I believe, is more than three urinary tract infections in six months. So if you are having, if you've had three documented urinary tract infections in six months, I think it's reasonable to say that you have chronic urinary tract infections. That would a test to test for a urinary tract infection would be a urinary culture. Um, which you would have to provide a urine sample at your doctor's office so they can send it out. Typically, take, it takes about three days to come back. They want to grow it, grow the bacteria. And if it doesn't grow, then it, it typically will come up, preliminary result will come up quicker, but three days um, to grow a bacteria. And if, they, if it grows out very soon, they want to also send it for sensitivities, and that's why it takes a little bit of time. Um, so thank you. And I think, um, you know, one of the questions that I, we commonly get um, with uh, in community health is, you know, you see women with multiple issues and mm -hmm. they want to conceive. So mm -hmm. like, let's say you have a woman who has, you know, um, one fallopian tube, mm -hmm. she has endometriosis, fibroid cysts, mm -hmm. she's got a thyroid issue that's mm -hmm. being medicated mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. And let's say she's mid forties. Mm -hmm. What is the likelihood of somebody like that getting pregnant? And if somebody wants to get pregnant, what would they need to do? Well, to be able to mid forties is, is the thing that jumps out at me the most. Like I said, all of those other issues really are going to depend on. So let's say she only has one ovary. Uh, let's say that she's had her tube side. Let's say that she's had a thyroid issue and she has fibroids. All of those issues are surface issues depending on the details. But if the, the most, um, the most determining factor for her fertility is going to be her age. The fact that she's over 40, like I said, the decline in her egg quality because of her age being over 40 is going to be the limiting factor for all of those things. A 25-year-old with all those, those, those things, you know, it's really just a matter of, have you tried? You know, a, a thyroid issue, she's having regular cycles. Um, she, if she had a tubal ligation, you know, then that would require IVF. But let's say she only has one ovary and she just had a thyroid issue and she has fibroids. Again, how long has she been trying? And is she having regular cycles? So, but age really is a limiting factor. Once you get over 40, then that becomes um, a time where if you're interested in getting pregnant and you haven't been able to get pregnant with having unprotected sex, regular cycles, again, this is all just preliminary advice. Uh, anytime you wanna, you're having trouble conceiving, you wanna talk to a gynecologist like myself. But let's say that we're in an office visit, we're listening in on an office visit. What I would be saying to this patient would be over 40, you've been trying for six months, haven't had, you haven't conceived, then I'm going to recommend you to see a reproductive endocrinologist specialist who specializes in infertility for treatment, specifically IVF. Yeah, I was just about to ask, when when does a woman qualify to go see an infertility specialist and when, right. when does she not? 
Like when are these conditions? Because we talked about a lot of different we conditions did. today, we did. right? We did. And when do those conditions um, are conditions that can be treated without having to go Correct. for assistance? And Correct. Then, and then there are conditions which, like you mentioned, that they would need to be referred right. to. Anyone over 40 interested in conceiving who hasn't conceived with having unprotected intercourse, like I said, you've been you've been followed up with a gynecologist and your primary care doctor, and you don't have any other medical conditions that could explain why you would have irregular cycles or maybe not having a cycle at all. All those things being equal, if you're over 40, you've been trying for six months and you haven't gotten pregnant, you're gonna be looking for someone who can either treat you for infertility, like a reproductive endocrinologic and infertility specialist, or a gynecologist who feels comfortable doing the preliminary workup and maybe even some initial treatments. But I would recommend a, a board certified um, or reproductive and endocrinologic and infertility specialist. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Francis. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Um, this concludes today's webinar, and we thank you all for joining us today. Um, please remember that the um, opinions shared here today by our medical expert are not a substitute for medical advice from a physician. If you need a physician, um, such as Dr. Francis, um, please call 1-888-724-7123. Or for more information about Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital Somerset, please visit us at www.rwjbh.org backslash Somerset. Thanks again, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great day. Bye.